Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so today we're very pleased to have Dmitry Kovatovich, who's a postdoc in the cryptography research group here, speaking to us on his work on cryptanalysis of AES and SHA-2. Thank you, Christian. Good morning, everyone. I'm also very pleased to have the opportunity to share my views on uh, the recent results on AES and SHA-2, where I participated. Um, as far as you might know, it made uh, some industry impact, some media impact, but um, the theoretical and practical consequences are quite different from which you might expect just looking at uh, newspapers and press reports. So I will talk today about uh, symmetric encryption and symmetric primitive uh, hashing, uh, symmetric hashing, uh, and uh, start with uh, talk about AES as a block cipher and about SHA-2 as a hash function. So just a uh, small uh, introduction to the framework. Uh, a block cipher is a fixed length encryption primitive, uh, which encrypts data block by block. And um, on the very high level, it's a permutation uh, parameterized uh, by a key. The key is secret. And uh, generally, the adversary goal when he attacks uh, a system using a block cipher is to recover that key to be an able to be able to read the encrypted communication and uh, most of the attacks on block ciphers are key recovery attacks as the most natural target and uh, the common framework for key recovery attacks and you are able to use some uh, data from the past some pairs on plain text and cipher text possibly chosen by you and uh, your target is to recover a key and hence being able to read the future communication. As uh, the key is, has fixed length, say n bits, then uh, an attack is considered valid, well, from a theoretical point of view, at least uh, if it recovers a key faster than just the end uh, trials. Because you can always try all possible keys just one by one. And of course, uh, as n is quite large, and in modern ciphers 128 and higher, then uh, a valid attack is not necessarily a practical attack, an attack you uh, might be concerned of. For hash function, citation is both a bit similar and both a bit, and a bit different. Hash function compresses arbitrary long inputs to fixed length values and is typically iterative. As a hash function has no secret, the attacks on it and uh, the compromising of a system which uses hash function is a bit different. And common, the most uh, devastating attacks on hash functions are those that find collisions, uh, which means uh, finding two different uh, inputs which yield the same hash value. And uh, an attack find a pre-image attack, which uh, just stands for the inversion of a hash function. So finding any uh, pre-image to this function. Collision attacks, uh, generic collision attacks run in 2 to the n over 2 when n is the hash length. So any collision attack faster than 2 to the n over 2 is again considered a valid attack. And uh, an attack, a pre-image attack faster than 2 to the n is also considered a valid attack. Again, n in modern hash function is quite large and again, Attacks are valid from a theoretical point of view are not necessary being any practical attack. And as you will see, most of the attacks we are talking about are not practical at all. And uh, my hypothesis is even that in future they might not be practical. So let me continue with uh, my first uh, topic. Uh, it's AES, Advanced Encryption Standard. I will try to talk about AES and the hash standard SHA-2 in parallel, try to um, show if they have some similarities in the design or in the attack vectors, 
and uh, in their security. So Advanced Encryption Standard, abbreviated as AES, was designed 15 years ago by two Belgian cryptographers, and uh, its original name is just uh, concatenation of the first letters of their last names, Reindal. So AES has uh, three versions uh, for different key sizes, 128, 192, and 256, and has different number of rounds. Each number is uh, a weaker sub-function, uh, which has both uh, nonlinear and linear elements. And uh, two rounds of AES are depicted on the right. So here uh, you see that each round starts with an addition of a so-called sub-key, which is derived from the original master key, and then three operations. Um, the same in every round, uh, first nonlinear operation sub-bytes, and then two linear operations. Despite this simplicity, uh, the cells uh, on the picture are bytes. Despite the simplicity, AES uh, proved itself to be a very tough target for attackers and cryptanalysts. Uh, when selected as AES, the best uh, key recovery attack was mounted on seven rounds, and it was uh, only a shortcut attack, which means that an advantage over just brute force key recovery was quite small. So a small factor, even not precisely evaluated by the authors of the paper. It was seven rounds for AES-128. You see that seven is quite, um, quite close to 10. Uh, so originally, AES-128 has 10 rounds. And while seven was quite close to 10, and some people said that it's not a big security margin, uh, the time proved that uh, the security margin is good enough, as for years, no attack on eight rounds, uh, no key recovery attacks on eight rounds appeared till the very last year. Despite of, well, I'm not exaggerating, so hundreds of papers were written on the AES crypto analysis, if, cover, if counting also uh, side channel analysis of uh, AES implementations. So really, almost any person uh, uh, who was doing some crypto analysis tried to break AES in his experience. So the design uh, and the competition for AES was public. That was, uh, sorry, that was uh, quite a contrast to SHA-2 as a hash standard. So it was designed around 2000 and adopted as a hash standard two years later. Uh, it also has uh, two different, well, it has four versions, but we are mainly interested in two, uh, the most important, 256 hash value and 512 bit hash value. So the first one has 64 rounds, the second one has 80, and the structure is quite different and actually was inherited from earlier hash function design. Um, well, the thing is, I'm not sure how clear it is from the picture, but my uh, impression is that uh, SHA-2 looks much more messy than AES. And uh, from um, many others' point of view, it's the true that uh, NSA, was, when designed uh, SHA-2, uh, didn't try to uh, make some kind of transparent design, uh, which was easy to evaluate for public, but just try to involve as many uh, strong operations as they wanted, uh, which resulted in, on one hand, quite a strong hash function. On the other hand, the analysis was very difficult. And many people just didn't try to start with uh, the analysis of SHA-2, and the number of papers of SHA-2 is sm much smaller compared to AES. And, well, on the one, on one hand, it says, uh, it tells us that SHA-2 is, is strong because people couldn't find any weakness. On the other hand, uh, most of the people who are working in the crypto symmetric crypto analysis will not be surprised if something will be found in SHA-2. Uh, I think it uh, is, uh, well, if something uh, reasonable will be found in AES, people will be greatly surprised. If something will be found in SHA-2, this will not be so good a surprise because SHA-2 actually doesn't carry with itself no kind of proofs for its strength, despite of numerous linear, nonlinear, and other types of elements appearing in its structure. So SHA-2 had now public elevation, no attacks, uh, in contrast to AES. What kind of attacks I'm talking about? Uh, let me make a small survey. So the first attacks uh, AES was designed to counteract were uh, so-called statistical attacks. 
The idea was to find any primitive a property which holds with reasonably high probability, say p. And uh, if you have this property, uh, for example, an input with property p or delta p uh, is converted, uh, transformed to ciphertext uh, to an output with property delta c, if this holds with reasonably high probability, then uh, on one hand we are able to uh, collect sufficiently many uh, inputs, outputs with this property, just making about uh, 1 over p encryptions. On the other hand, each uh, so-called right plain text ciphertext pair yield information about internal variables as this property is just kind of sequence of properties throughout the cipher. And as you know that this property was halted uh, different internal variables, so this gives you information about these internal variables. So if you have some property, not just you measured something over a cipher, but you claim that in the cipher something happened here, something happened here, something happened here, and just multiplicate the probability of this event, you get the, the property for the full cipher. And if you observe this kind of property, which means that indeed with, it's likely that these events indeed uh, uh, appeared, and this gives you information about internal variables, and from the information of internal, internal variables, you get information about the key. That was the main principle of statistical attacks appeared in the beginning of 90s, starting with uh, attacks on deaths. Uh, the feature of uh, differential linear cryptanalysis was that despite they broke deaths uh, theoretically, they didn't break it practically in the sense that no one really wanted to. Uh, if someone ha uh, has a goal to recover a desk key, uh, he didn't implement uh, nor of this method. Well, linear cryptanalysis was kind of implemented, so guys really collected uh, 2 to the 40 or something data, and they just tried to recover the key, and they uh, succeeded. But uh, so far, if you are interested in finding a desk key, you rather buy a dedicated hardware, which is less than $10,000 cost, and it will recover a 56-bit key of this without requiring all this uh, tremendous amounts of data. So what is interesting is that uh, despite this method appeared more than 20 years ago, so far there is no good method which uh, uh, can recover this key better than just brute force, I mean, practically better. Uh, for SHA-2 city and uh, its uh, predecessor situation is a bit, bad, uh, is a bit different. Um, as I talked about collision and pre-image resistance, for um, both SHA-0 and SHA-1, uh, which are similar to SHA-2 but simpler and weaker, uh, collision attacks exist, and on SHA-0 there is a practical attack, I mean there are practical collisions for SHA-0. For SHA-1 there is no practical attack, but there is a theoretical attack with complexity about to the 61, which is just uh, a bit behind the computational power of a normal research unit, that's why uh, these collisions have been never found. Though there, there, there is a couple of projects that try to find these kind of collisions. And there was no pre-image attacks on the full version, nor of SHA-0, nor on SHA-1. So, so far, success, successful pre-image attacks exist only on much weaker functions like MD5. So on MD5, there is a non, complete non-practical pre-image attack, but on SHA-0 and SHA-1, there is no pre-image attack on the full version. And the situation with SHA-2 is even worse. OK, that was my quick introduction to ES and SHA-2. And uh, this uh, kind of set situation with uh, no attacks on the full version existed till 2009 when, well, like in 2009 AES uh, has existed for about 10 years and uh, really people start to think that uh, AES is something more than a good cipher. So maybe AES as a structure which takes just two inputs, plain text and a key, uh, can be a good universal primitive even when you don't care which is the plain text, which is the key, you just have function which compresses two input to uh, one output and it's uh, for one input it's a kind of permutation, parameterized by a second input. Well, people started to think that uh, it can serve as a universal primitive, though it was never formally stated. Well, this was proved to be wrong, so this is the starting point where our 
attacks on AES appeared. Well, do you have any questions by this point? You said ten thousand dollar machine. How fast does it break? Keys? Several days. Couple of days. And, and uh, it was designed several kind of three, four years ago. So, so I think with current hardware designs, it can be even faster. So the first step towards uh, showing some weaknesses in AES were so-called related key attacks, uh, which uh, try to demonstrate that AES is not good as a universal primitive. So they didn't demonstrate that AES is uh, bad uh, as an encryption standard. As uh, this kind of attacks required that uh, a user is able to observe uh, and work on data encrypted onto different but related keys. And the relation between the keys depicted here as A and B is even chosen by the adversary. The relation was itself quite complicated, so it's not just a large subset of relations which you can use. The relation was chosen uh, following uh, some properties of AES. And, uh, it was chosen so that the difference, so-called difference in keys, can be combined with this difference in plain text, and uh, this relation in key can be uh, can so somehow cancel the relation in the plain text. That's why uh, the data encrypted on two keys was uh, correlated in some sense, and from the, this correlation, one is able to recover either key. That was uh, the framework, and um, two attacks appeared on AES. The first attack uh, didn't recover anything. It just demonstrated the property of a full AES. Um, kind of strange property. So suppose you can choose uh, several plain text and several keys, different in each step, but uh, they have the common property. So if you select a specific difference delta key in uh, the keys, then encryption of each plain text, the difference of encryptions on, uh, say, key one and uh, the changed key one, on key two and changed key two, uh, yields the same ciphertext difference. So you are able, for example, it can be just an exercise of, suppose you have a cipher and you are able to choose uh, all this plain text, all these keys, uh, single difference of the, in the key and single difference in the ciphertext. How hard it is, to, uh, is it to construct this thing? It was proved that it's uh, hard. It's uh, for a large Q, it's uh, close to, to, to the N, and the, the key size. And uh, it was demonstrated that uh, such construction can be found on a PC for AES-256, uh, which was a large difference in complexity with total 128 or total 256, but it uh, demonstrated only some property of the full AES when using different keys. It didn't tell anything about the security of AES as a, a single key encryption scheme. Some stronger attacks, but also in the related key model appeared uh, half a year later. Uh, it uh, indeed recovered the key, but it had to observe data encrypted on four different keys, and the relation between uh, those keys was chosen in an even more complicated way, and the complexity was much higher. So it was not possible to uh, recover a key on a PC anymore, so it was uh, a theoretical result, and it was a theoretical result in a weaker model. So uh, despite uh, this uh, first science of uh, Weaknesses in AES, that was still a weakness in uh, quite a weak setting, in the related key setting, so-called. In those years, nothing basically happened to SHA-2. Uh, so I proceed to um, the recent attacks on AES, which also found their applications in SHA-2. Well, chronologically, it was uh, uh, opposite, so the first, uh, first attacks on Chateau were found, and then we figured out how to translate them to AES, but uh, attacks on AES got more attention, so I started with them. It m might be even simpler to explain. 
So the recent attacks on AES operate in so -called, uh, with, with the so-called meet-in-the-middle technique. I uh, aim to explain you the meet-in-the-middle technique in uh, almost completely. I hope, well, I think that it's one of the simplest technique to recover a key uh, when you can apply it. And the underlying idea is, uh, for me again, looks quite simple. So suppose you have a function that uh, transforms input to output, and it has some, para some parameter. Suppose it's, uh, this function can be split it into two sub-functions. So suppose it's iterative. And suppose also that the first part of the transformation uses, say, the first uh, half of the parameter, and the second part of the transformation uses only the second part of the parameter. And given an input and an output, uh, you are asked to find the parameter value. So what you are going to do, you just uh, simply split the parameter into two parts. The first one, uh, as you assume, is used only in the, first in the first half of the transformation. The second one used only in the second part. And uh, for each possible value of the first parameter, you compute the function up to the middle. You take an output and invert in the function, you compute uh, again the same state uh, for all possible values of the second half of the parameter, of parameter 2. And you are looking for uh, a colliding pair. And if uh, some states here collides with states from the upward computation, which means that you get a value transformation from input to output, and uh, a combination of this parameter 1 and parameter 2 values uh, yields you uh, a valid uh, value of the full parameter. So if a parameter has uh, n bits, then this attack finds a uh, value uh, with the complexity to the n over 2. That's true, uh, so, and uh, that's true for, say, one input-output pair. But if you have two input-output pairs, then you can run this attack in parallel, and you just have more conditions in the middle. And uh, with just increasing the number of input-output pairs, uh, it's very unlikely that uh, the key that you find is not a legitimate key. And even if you have only a single pair, you greatly reduce the size of uh, the number of keys, candidate keys. A kind of, uh, we can reformulate this property as follows. There are two to the n possible parameters, and I'm able to enumerate all these parameters as pairs, and the first element of a pair can get 2 to the n over 2 values, and the second element also get 2 to the n over 2 values. So what I'm able to do, I'm able to cover 2 to the n parameters with just 2 to the n over 2 computations. And uh, which means that I can uh, test many parameters uh, with much faster than testing them one by one with a kind of square root advantage here. And uh, this idea is, uh, um, the, the same idea is in the attack on AES. So we will be able to enumerate many keys with much smaller number of computations. And from that, we get an advantage. An application to this principle is... Uh, an attack on infamous double dash. So double dash has 64-bit state and just two 56-bit keys, which are used in two subsequent invocations of a regular dash. Suppose you have uh, two plain text and cipher text pairs uh, under a secret key. Then uh, you recover that key as follows, following the simple uh, the meet in the middle framework. You just uh, consider all possible first keys and compute the middle state. You, as this can be inverted, you uh, compute the middle state for all possible second keys. 
and uh, a matching pair yields you a candidate key. And for uh, two plain text hypertext pair, it's very likely that uh, this candidate key is the secret key. The complexity of this attack is only 2 to the 56, which is, uh, of course, much smaller than uh, just uh, exhaustive search for all possible 112-bit keys. The same principle, well, this attack uh, appeared more than 30 years ago, but uh, it can be, uh, the main principle is reused in our attacks on AES. Well, it's not uh, simple to use it because by default, uh, this kind of attacks can cover only, say, one third of AES or so. That's why they were never uh, explored that deeply. The question was how to extend them extend the range of this attack to cover the remaining AES round. And that was done with the construction that we call a B-click. Uh, someone even told me that in Japanese, B-clicks mean something. Sorry? It uh, didn't work on AES uh, so simply because uh, the AES key cannot be splitted so simply. Yeah, due to the key expansion, it was not possible to separate, uh, well, what not, not clear how to separate AES key into independent parts of key material. Okay, so what we decided to do, someone said that uh, it's something like happiness. I was told that once at some crypto coffee break. <laughs> Isn't true, it's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, the idea of, um, of a weekly construction is again, as in the meet in the middle attack, to enumerate more keys with fewer states or computations. So that you can compute less and still test and uh, try uh, more keys. In this example, uh, I suppose that uh, I want to test, say, nine keys, uh, which form a matrix, three by three. And I construct something looks like a bipartite graph with three states on the left, three states on the right. This is a part of a cipher. Um, so that for each key from the matrix, there exists a transformation from one state to a cipher text. Uh, following uh, this formula. So in this structure, Nine keys are described or enumerated with three states and three ciphertexts. And uh, assuming you can find this construction for, well, larger constructions for a large number of keys for reasonably many, say, rounds of AES, then uh, the full attack looks as follows. you split a cipher into three parts. For the last part, you construct this uh, complicated big leak with many keys. But uh, your assumption is you can do it easily. For the remaining parts, which for AES is only three or four rounds, that is the length that was possible, that was kind of breakable but meet in the middle attacks, but these attacks were not popular because it's only three or four rounds. So in the left part, above beige and green uh, rectangles, we use a simple meet in the middle attacks. Uh, the key element is that um, I enumerate the keys in the way that if uh, I can run a meet in the middle attack in this part, that then from one 
state, I am allowed to, use, to make only one computation. And from the cipher text, if they, I ask for the decryption, I also need only one computation in one direction. So the idea is similar to middle middle attacks. So from the states, uh, in a big click, I compute backward some middle state. From the cipher text of a big click, I ask for the decryption and compute some middle states. And the matching pair yields my candidate key. There exists uh, uh, more or less uh, convincing argument that the attack works because uh, if I assume that some key is the right key, the key of my matrix uh, which I used in the bigly construction is the right key, then if I trace the uh, encryption of a plain text on those keys, then I will see that it will follow exactly the pattern of my meet in the middle attack. And following the bigly construction, I'm, uh, and the bigly construction helps me to detect that this is the right key. So summarizing, the bigly construction helps me to uh, test many keys with small amortized complexity, and it allows me to run meet in the middle attacks on much smaller rounds that is required. For that number of rounds that was possible originally. So originally it was possible to run in the middle attacks on three or four rounds of AES, and we found how to construct a big click for the remaining, say, four rounds. That gave us a new attack. The problem with um, attack on AES28 was as follows. It was ra rather easy to construct a small big click for many rounds, and large big click which gives uh, a larger advantage over brute force for smaller number of rounds. And uh, originally, the very first attack we got, it, it didn't cover the full AES, and it had a uh, very uh, small advantage over brute force. So the question was, is it possible to combine these ideas to get something on the full AES? And the idea was to uh, admit explicitly that we uh, do a bit of exhaustive search of keys in the very small portion of the cipher. So for AES192, uh, the number of operations we do for each key is only one-fifth of a cipher, which means uh, essentially that we can uh, test all AES192 keys uh, five times as fast as by exhaustive search. That was a kind of cheating. But uh, before it was, well, generally people didn't complain that, well, they, it was generally admitted that if an attack has an advantage of, say, five, six times uh, over brute force, that it's a valid attack. And yeah, but by almost any uh, formal definition of an attack, uh, this is a valid attack. That a bit contradicted the nature of previous attacks because they tried to uh, recover a key in a very complicated way and uh, never uh, had kind of portions of exhaustive search. So we just decided to use these portions of exhaustive search explicitly, and this yielded us uh, this advantage over brute force. So this is the summary of our results, and uh, they mean that we decreased the security level of AES uh, two to three bits only. But that was the first result on the full AES versions. The question, of course, appeared, uh, is this an attack or is it an optimization of exhaustive search? And well, a simple answer is that for practical purposes, it doesn't matter. So if you are able to recover a key five, five times faster than before, it doesn't matter how, how, how you can do it from uh, a more a smarter search or from an attack or from some kind of, I don't know, set solver or whatever, it doesn't matter. So if you are able to recover a key faster than needed, then you succeed. And uh, we, as, uh, we have uh, arguments uh, that if there appears in future an adversary with this computational power, it will, he will choose our method over uh, a simple 
exhaustive search. So, which means that by many arguments, this should be considered an attack. But this definitely should not be considered as a threat, and uh, probably this shouldn't be considered, uh, this doesn't have any uh, practical implication. Because uh, the fact that you do even a small portion uh, of a cipher for each key, this uh, essentially gives you a lower bound on the complexity of your attack. And this lower bound can be beaten. So if you consider even a single bit operation for each key, this is still much uh, more than you can do uh, on the computer with the computational power of the Earth. Because uh, we had have a kind of stronger claim that if an attacker would want to optimize an exhaustive search in some way, this is the smartest way he can choose. Because it's uh, in several steps, it's very simple. It's very similar, sorry, to the exhaustive search in particular uh, steps. And we just show how to shave off a large portion of a cipher. So instead of exhaustive search over 10 rounds of AES, we propose to exhaustively search on two rounds of AES. And of course, it's appealing. This is pretty much the same operations as the adversary would choose for exhaustive search over the keys. So claiming that we have basically the same operation and we, our attacks are deterministic. Uh, so we can prove that if, uh, uh, that any key will be found. So there is basically little reason to prefer exhaustive search to our attack, and our attacks can be also traded for a different amount of data. So there exist different trade-offs. So this optimized version requires larger data, but um, almost any uh, number of uh, plain text and cipher text can be used in this attack. Yes. So there's some heuristic argument going on there uh, about uh, kind of number of collisions uh, in this uh, uh, in the middle in the middle, in the middle uh, attack. Uh, so uh, is it possible to have a kind of a win-win argument uh, to the fact that uh, if something if your uh, if your assumptions about distribution of this intermediate outputs are wrong? then it only benefits your attack. That it points to some structural weakness, another structural weakness of the AS that can be exploited. Uh, well, I would say that we do not rely on any distribution properties in the middle. We only claim that, and we can prove it, that if the, well, our attack can be seen as testing several, as testing keys and groups. We take a group of 256-bit key, we test it very fast. We take another group, we test it very fast, and so on and so forth. And for each group, we can prove that if a secret key is among this group, then it will be found with our procedure. Doesn't matter what the distribution is, it will be found. So, uh, and the time complexity, of, uh, time complexity of, the, of the attack is again fixed. It doesn't rely on any curve. Doesn't rely. Sorry? Is this about as like, good as this attack is likely to get, or do you have a feel for it seems like there's still a lot of room for it? No, the, uh, I really feel that uh, there is no big room for this attack. So in the, with the idea that you do some portion of exhaustive search, uh, you can go really far. And so far, there is no clue how to avoid it. These are so-called big leaks. Only large big leaks give you a reasonable advantage. And they are very difficult to construct for more rounds. That's why. You, you can truly create a big leak for one round and then exhaust search the remaining rounds and gain you almost nothing. Yes. OK, so that was the summary of attacks on AES. I will cover now the attacks on SHA-2 and then uh, give my 
views on the perspectives of both standards. So when speaking about hash functions, I talk about collision and pre-image resistance. And as I said, the SHA-2 design was, uh, so was very difficult to analyze. And uh, collision, most of the collision search technique were found to be uh, inapplicable to SHA-2 or uh, found me working for only a few rounds. For example, I remind you that uh, the SHA-2 SHA-256 has 64 rounds and only recently a 27 round collision was found uh, for SHA-256. And it was found on a PC and there was no clue how to expand this attack on more rounds. Uh, there were no idea how to um, design a, a theoretical but not practical attack with complex SA2 to the 100 for more rounds. So what people are able to do, yes? Just be clear, a 15 round is completely trivial and a 16 round is very simple, right? 15 round, you haven't even read every word, input word. Yes, it's not that trivial, but... No, no, the last input word is not read. Hmm? On 15 rounds, you've only read 15 of the 16 input words. Yes, so yes, yes. Yeah, 15 rounds is completely trivial. 16 yes. round is very, very simple. And Okay, so for collision attack situation is very difficult and so far only ad hoc methods which require lots of programming and which are very difficult to when for presenting papers and so on. For pre-image attacks the situation is a bit different and uh, the best pre-image attacks in terms of breaking the number of round, the maximum number of rounds is uh, a version of our Big click attack. That was chronologically the first big click attack. Um, appeared even before the ES attack uh, was designed. But uh, the key property is despite we didn't use any exhaustive search tricks, the complexity of a pre image search is very close to 256. Few rounds have a uh, larger advantage over brute force, but still not much. And this 46 rounds is only two thirds of a hash function with the complexity very close to the brute force. How to treat uh, this situation and uh, should we expect that uh, more rounds can be broken with uh, similar techniques? Can I just ask before you go on, um, how much better do you get if you go down to say 40 rounds or something like that? I will show you okay. shortly. Uh, now I'll show my uh, favorite pictures. I could, uh, for AES, there appeared many techniques. And in these hundreds of papers that were written on the AES, there were designed new methods, improvements to these methods, small uh, tricks and improvements for those improvements, and so on and so forth. But the overall result, uh, for AES-128 and that security level uh, is here and I wouldn't say that it uh, makes the situation very diff different to what we had 15 years ago when AES was just designed. So when it was designed uh, there was uh, almost no practical six round attack and all the attacks for seven rounds and higher were not possible. Over years, there appeared a bit better six round attack, a significantly better, well, for practical terms. But uh, all the attacks in the last uh, dozens of papers deals with improvements in this area over two to the 100. And here is our attack. And the summary is all this attack, including our attack, provides a very high. Uh, theoretical value, but for security level uh, of AS128, they have a uh, really small impact. This is good. This is actually what we aimed for, to prove that even the best techniques uh, doesn't, do not decrease the security level of AES and it is still secure. Can I just ask, 
I remember right, a lot of the improvements on the left, lower left side on the green line were done during the AES competition, right? No, the AES is by way of work. There was a proposal that the competition was had run there until 2000. And so yeah. The six and seven rounds were improved uh, during the competition. So yeah, seven rounds was a bit improved. And yeah, well, these results were indeed during the competition. Seven round impossible differential is below the 112 uh, sacred number that the NSA now publishes. If, if it were an attack on AES 2088, then it would be out, outlawed. Sorry? 112 is the lowest number that, that NIST and NSA, NSA talk about anymore in security. So mm. you and the, the impossible differential point is below this line. Yes. But of course, it's just seven rounds. And it's 112 because they have triple that. <laughs> Talking of bureaucracy. If you have a tough time. Okay, so, and from this graphic, uh, for me, it's uh, very hard to make a meaningful prediction about the future of AES. And, but for, uh, I would personally say that uh, over the future 10 years, if we expect even the same progress, with, uh, well, suppose this green line can be uh, moved to the right for the same distance. This still doesn't, wouldn't give you an attack, a meaningful attack on 10 rounds. And the practical attacks, well, what is the distance we have passed for practical attacks? If you select, say, to the 70 as more or less practical value, which is feasible, say, for governments, then the step over 15 years is less than a round. If you extrapolate this, then may yes, could be considered secure for the future, I don't know, 30 years, at least. For Chateau situation is similar. Starting with, uh, for collision attacks, well, there were only a few collision attacks on Shuttle 56. But still, uh, we are quite far from doing something on 64 rounds. So the distance we have passed is uh, indeed 11 rounds from 16 to 27. And um, over eight years or so, and it would probably take us 20, 30 more years to make something meaningful for 64 rounds of Shuttle 56. That's for collision resistance. That's probably more interesting because most of the numbers here are within some meaningful range. For pre-image resistance, all the numbers are purely theoretical. Here the increase, and I'm not aware of any pre-image attack on Shuttle 56 with a reasonable number of rounds, which is below to the 128. For 16 rounds, you probably can do that. The problem is that uh, your, you in each round, you update uh, one, with one word of message, you update two words of the state. So it's not completely trivial to use this. For Shavan, yeah. For Shavan, uh, 16 rounds you can do simply. But for Shatu, it's not that simple. And um, the progress we have seen again over years this, it can be extrapolated, that's true. And probably for in the, la in the future 10 years, we will see some attacks in this range about around 200 or so on the full Shuttle 56. But unless there will be a progress, there, unless there is a progress in practical pre-image attacks, uh, there is no practical threat. And all the pre-image, all this dozen of pre-image attacks appeared recently. 95% of them uh, deal with, uh, are uh, beyond the birthday bound, have complexity larger than 2 to the end over 2 because of, the, of their mid and the middle nature. And uh, the prospects for cryptanalysts are on one hand, sad, because 
it will probably be very difficult to find some uh, practical attack on either standard. On the other hand, there is uh, much room for improvement and many more techniques can be designed and used on SHA-256 and AES. My summary of, on the attacks on these two standards is that AES is still very secure. I have several ideas, uh, well, kind of, it's natural to ask for better properties found in the full a in AES on more rounds or better meet in the middle attacks, but still it's very secure. And for Chateau, we probably need a better understanding of its elements of the modular addition, which is used on um, non-linear edges that are used and so on. And from these two plots, my personal claim is that probably we, don't, we are not in big need on, uh, in SHA-3. At least from the practical point of view. Unless the practical side you'd like to have is bad one. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Uh, yeah, well, for uh, the Cypher IDEA that was designed over 20 years ago, we have uh, uh, better attacks. Well, on the full version, we have a bit larger advantage, but for reduced version with a big click, we can do much better. So it's advantage of 2020 or so. Possibly, well, I think it's all convertible to the ciphers uh, vulnerable to meet in the middle attacks. You probably can do some, can make some cipher resistant uh, to, main, to many attacks, but vulnerable to meet in the middle. Yeah, that's a good exercise, but a very important, uh, I would stress that all meet in the middle attacks have lower bound on their complexity, and that's the square root of the parameter length your attack. If you take 128-bit key, you can be faster than 264. If you consider pre-image attacks on 256-bit uh, digest, you can be better than 128. Uh, well, it's not necessary to make a toy cipher. Well, to demonstrate that we can test keys faster than exhaustive search, we can take just a smaller subset of AES keys and, and demonstrate that we can test them faster. That's purely possible. Highly possible. Well, as the cipher we are attacking is still secure, then it probably was a good design. How do your SHA-2 attacks work on the SHA-3 candidates? Uh, One versus the other. Well, uh, only for most of the SHA-3 candidates, they're not working at all because they have different structure. Uh, this so-called white pipe design. Uh, the, well, they do not work, but uh, the consequence of the white pipe design is that you sacrifice a significant amount of speed to it, and most of the white pipe SHA-3 candidates are not even faster than SHA-2. What does the data requirement of your AES attack? Uh, in the published version, it's from two to the 40 to the 80, but it can be really downgraded with only a small penalty in the time complexity. So the mean this pretty much the same can be with to the 8 to the 16 data, chosen data. 
So it's uh, only an exercise, really. Uh, I expect some people finding low data complexity attacks on AES, but it's just a matter of technical work. These methods are very suitable for trading data for complexity. Yeah, well, for, for example, the scan design is quite natural. Uh, it's very suitable for this type of attacks, but uh, for collision and perimeter resistance, we are still, uh, well, overall for SHA-3 candidates, uh, collision and perimeter attacks can cover about one third of the design. So if you have 12 rounds and four rounds can be uh, are vulnerable for collision or pre-image attacks, theoretically. And uh, for scan, it's about the same situation, but with this kind of attacks for other shutter candidates, uh, again, one third of them is vulnerable, but for different kinds of attacks. So these attacks do not uh, give uh, much higher advantage in this sense. 